So David Benjamin, um, I could say a lot about David. He's a very close colleague. We, we taught together at Columbia for, I don't know, 10 years or so, and the last five years worked very closely together um, on, a, on a project. Um, uh, David, for me, is um, kind of representative of a new generation of, of architects. And I would ask and encourage all of the students to really pay attention to what he's doing because he, I think he, um, he's kind of a pioneer of a new way of thinking about design, a new way of thinking about architecture, and certainly a, a new way of thinking about how to practice architecture. Um, I think he's, he's doing some very interesting things in how he's organized his practice. He's an associate professor at Columbia. Uh, he's a director of the uh, Living Architecture Lab at Columbia. Um, he has a practice called The Living. Um, and probably one of the most interesting things recently that happened is that uh, last year, his design firm, The Living, got acquired by Autodesk. Now, you know, that might seem like a normal thing. Autodesk, you know, they acquire a lot of uh, startup firms. This is how they innovate. You might not know it, but Revit is an acquisition. Autodesk didn't invent Revit. It was a small startup that they bought. Dynamo, again, uh, an acquisition by Autodesk. But this is the first time that Autodesk acquired a design firm. Um, when it happened, I have to be honest, I was sort of shocked. You know, I, he didn't tell me about it. He just said, you know, I read it in the news. Um, and I said, what's going on here? Um, but first year, I don't think Autodesk really knows what's going to come out of this. I don't think David really knows. But there's some interesting things brewing. And most importantly, I think it... It's just an indication of how our industry and how the profession of architecture is changing, becoming very intertwined with software and digi digital technology. And I think what David is doing in his practice is kind of expanding that way beyond uh, what is kind of vernacular uh, in, the, in the profession now. So, um, um, so please welcome me and uh, or help me in welcoming David to Georgia Tech. Uh, it's a real honor to have you here as the first lecture uh, uh, for the season. David. Oops, I think I might need some help with the buttons here. And, and then just Great. turn your mic on. Okay. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, thanks, Scott, for that um, generous introduction. And, you know, it's, uh, it's great to be here um, at Georgia Tech. And, you know, I'm, I'm especially pleased to be here, Scott, at, at your invitation. And, um, you know, we've had uh, a kind of long-running discussion about a lot of these topics and, you know, working with you and just talking to you about ideas and technologies has been a big influence on my work and you've been a, a, a mentor to, to some of my own ideas and, and my practice. Um, and uh, so what I wanted to do tonight actually is um, kind of um, develop uh, a picture around a lot of the things we've been thinking about recently, which is, which is also really to say to describe some of our latest thoughts about this new kind of practice um, that we've been developing for the past few years. Um, most recently now in partnership with Autodesk, um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the concepts and some of the projects uh, uh, before that partnership. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, um, a kind of a practice and an approach to architecture and design that um, really involves a kind of ecosystem, a design ecosystem with interconnected loops of ideas, materials, technology, culture, um, digital influences, biological influences, um, touching on humans and non-humans and the natural environment. And in other words, it's an approach that um, very much thinks of these loops as interconnected and related, um, as if it doesn't really make sense to isolate one of these loops and think about it alone, but they only kind of make sense and kind of gather momentum through their connections to, to other loops. Um, we like to think of these loops as kind of continually 
uh, influencing one another um, in a kind of dynamic system and that the dynamic system itself is continually changing and adapting. Uh, so in other words, our approach um, in many ways creates um, dynamic adaptive architecture, dynamic adaptive projects, but the approach itself is dynamic and adaptive and continually evolving. Um, and as part of this approach, uh, you know, we, we kind of welcome some things that would normally be um, uh, the kind of enemies of design. In other words, uh, we like to design at multiple scales simultaneously. We anticipate and we welcome rapid change. Um, uh, we embrace design with uncertainty. Uh, we design with rules and relationships rather than simply with fixed forms. And we're very interested in designing with shifting and unknowable forces. So in other words, in other, it, it, rather than um, seeking architecture to be something static and inert and permanent, we're very interested in architecture being something that can respond um, in, a, uh, in a flexible, uh, sensitive, adaptive, dynamic way to the ever-changing conditions of our world. Um, and with that, um, what I'd like to do, you know, for the for the uh, the majority of this talk is describe um, several different concepts um, which uh, which have been influencing us uh, for the past few years, and to illustrate each concept with an example project. Um, the foundation, of course, um, for us is prototyping, and which is to say that we like to think of um, projects that are futuristic. We like to explore possibilities of the future. Um, in some ways, we're utopian in our, in our aims and our desires, but we're also um, uh, interested in testing out projects and ideas with things we can actually uh, make today. Um, so uh, we're interested in addressing some of today's urgent questions and issues, but with today's available um, technologies and approaches. So prototyping is key to all of our um, projects, and that's why I list it as uh, number zero here. It's kind of the foundation for everything we do. And then I'm going to explore a few other um, uh, concepts and numbers. Um, so this is an approach that we developed a few years ago called flash research. And this uh, was a kind of self-invented approach that involved projects with um, limitations, a, a limited time of three months or less, a limited budget of $1,000 or less, but that nevertheless um, aimed to explore a new architectural idea through creating a demo or a full-scale functioning prototype. Um, this gives you a sense of our iterative method. Um, these were uh, a few different prototypes that we created in one of our flash research projects. And we basically challenged ourselves to create a, uh, a functioning prototype each week and gradually explore ideas, add features um, to think about an, an architectural idea. Uh, one example flash research project uh, we call Living Glass. And it started with the material, um, in this case with the shape memory alloy, sometimes called a muscle wire. Maybe some of, some of you guys have used this. It's basically a thin wire that contracts along its length when you apply electricity to it. And this is a diagram of the kind of molecules changing in that material. Um, and fast forward three months, you know, we spent about $1,000 on prototypes. And we created this, uh, which we call living glass, which is a thin transparent membrane that uh, opens and closes gills in its surface and kind of comes alive uh, when you trigger sensors. Um, here's one example of it um, attached to a carbon dioxide sensor, which basically gives you a version of glass that breathes. And not only that, it breathes back at you when you breathe into it. So it's triggered by carbon dioxide you can breathe into the sensor and cause these gills uh, in the surface to open and close. Um, at the end of one of these projects, one of these type of flash research projects, we publish things like instructions um, and circuit diagrams and little pieces of code 
um, in addition to publishing kind of photographs of a, of a finished piece. And that's very much based on this ecosystem idea that we're designing in the context of interconnected loops and we're designing open-ended hooks for others to build off of where we left off. So each flash research project we do, we publish some instructions that would allow others to learn pretty much what we learned and demonstrate it to themselves in about a day so that they can explore further directions. And we've explored this approach with some classes we teach at Columbia. Um, and this is what some of our students did with the same material and, and using our instructions, um, but obviously a totally different project. Um, this is called the Huggy Wall. Um, and then we often try to develop um, our projects a little bit further um, from flash research into larger prototypes. Um, so actually, this project called Living City started that way, which was based on the idea that um, buildings already have a lot of sensors, physical sensors for things like temperature, humidity, presence of people. Um, but as sophisticated as buildings have become these days, often buildings hold all of that information to themselves. And the idea of this project is what if buildings shared their sensor, sensor data uh, with a network of other buildings? Um, what could be possible? Oops. And um, more specifically, to test out this idea, we built some custom sensors for air quality, some custom pretty low-tech software to grab the data from the sensors, and a larger array of the original flash research project, the Living Glass, um, to interact in response. So we had input, which was air quality sensors, uh, processing some uh, uh, kind of custom software, and then um, uh, output, which was the breathing of a, of a surface. Um, here, this gives you a sense of one of the custom air quality sensors connected to a battery and a radio. And that means we can install one of these sensor units uh, without wires in the inside and outside of a building, be uh, monitoring the data that's coming in about air quality, and then um, potentially acting on that data. Uh, we installed this in a couple of test uh, installations. The first one was on the Empire State Building in New York City, and you see some of these sensor units kind of on the facade of the building. Um, and we sent all of this data back to a kind of prototype building facade, and we were imagining what could happen if buildings not only collected a lot of sensor data, not only acted on that sensor data locally, but shared that sensor data to other buildings so each building could act not only on local data, but on remote data, on other buildings' data. And in other words, this breathing building envelope could open and close based on not only what's happening locally, but what's happening in nearby buildings and in buildings uh, maybe across the country or across the world. So simple. Um, prototype, but testing a pretty big idea, which is to say, you know, what if buildings that are having all of these uh, embedded sensors these days, what if our things in this so-called world of Internet of Things um, could respond to anything? Um, you know, what might happen? What might buildings say to each other? How might that change um, the way architecture works? And we tested it out through this prototype, got something running, and even though our test was with air quality, what we think one application might be, if we're thinking how could this be interesting, um, we think that if buildings could share their energy use in real time, then they could cooperate as a neighborhood or as a city to uh, trigger their highest peak energy use at a time when other buildings aren't triggering theirs, therefore reducing overall peak demand of a system or of a city's consumption and thereby eliminating some of the older coal-fired power plants. So um, that is kind of the ecosystem that we uh, had developed for prototyping, testing out ideas, you know, in a small scale, but that had a big implication. And um, here are a few different additional approaches and projects as we're kind of building the ecosystem. So this is more or less chronological in the development of our projects and ideas over the past few years. Um, so this ingredient, number one, information. This is a project called Living Light. It was uh, commissioned by basically the city of Seoul, South Korea. Um, and these are two pictures of Seoul um, uh, on different days from the exact same vantage point. And this shows, of course, that 
there's great fluctuations in air quality in Seoul like there is in many cities. So uh, one way of saying it would be there's an air quality problem. Um, Seoul actually already has a, a great awareness of air quality and some really interesting real-time public interfaces to air quality. On the left, you see a digital billboard that's displaying in real time the level of PM10, which is basically small particulates that are very unhealthy to breathe. So real-time interface being this number that's changing all the time that you can see as you're driving by. And there's also a couple of really good websites that show you the city of Seoul, which you can see on the right, um, and uh, you know, different neighborhoods and what the air quality is. Seoul also has this interesting uh, recent building culture of dynamic LED facades. Um, and you can get a sense of what those, some of those look like. You, know, you see the moving image on the lower right. Um, so, you know, so you have dynamic facade, it can show a lot of things and often it shows things like rainbows or patterns or flowers. And our idea was, well, what if we could combine these two things, a dynamic facade with LEDs and displaying information that's relevant and important to a city such as air quality uh, in a prototype. Um, so we started with the map of the city. This is uh, Seoul and uh, the different neighborhoods or goos in the city. Um, here are 27 existing air quality sensors run by the government. We redrew the map um, according to air quality or air boundaries rather than political boundaries or geographic boundaries. So in other words, um, each polygon here represents um, the, the air that's closest to one of these sensors, one of these dots. And then we took that and literally made a physical version of it. So we took the map of the city, bent it into a kind of dome-like shape, um, and uh, created a, a structure that could be out in a public park. Um, and this basically allowed us to experiment with a new building facade idea. So um, this building facade um, was not only you know, showing something about the city, which is the map of the city, but it was meant to be dynamic, interactive, um, and displaying uh, information in a few ways. First, it was a display of uh, air quality improvement. So in other words, you see this canopy, and every uh, panel uh, corresponds to a neighborhood of the city, and every panel is illuminated if its air quality is better right now uh, than a year ago. So it's a kind of display, a comparative display of air quality improvement. So here you see a few panels lit up. Those neighborhoods are having better air quality now than a year ago. The other ones are not. Um, second, it's a display of real-time air quality. So every hour, the whole map goes dark, and the panels illuminate in current uh, order of best air quality to worst. So here you're comparing between neighborhoods right now the other way is you're comparing, the previous way was you're comparing um, each neighborhood to itself a year ago. And finally, and what we think is most interesting to add as an ingredient to this mix, is that it's a display of public interest in the environment. So in other words, we set up a simple um, text message hotline. Um, you can send in a zip code or postal code to this hotline. Um, and the postal code that you're requesting information about, it blinks on the map. It blinks twice. And then you get back uh, the real-time air quality. So it's a way of taking something people already do, which is uh, request a lot of information, receive a lot of information on a mobile device, but it's making a kind of collective public register of that information. So that, in other words, if you look at this map, this physical potential building facade in the city, and you see a lot of blinking right now, you know there's a lot of interest in the environment right now. If you see more blinking in one neighborhood than another, you see, you, you know, you know that there's more requests for that neighborhood. So it becomes a way of um, bringing this ecosystem of data exchange um, out into the public. Um, here's the, the construction. It's in a, a public park in, in Seoul, and it's, it's permanent. It's a permanent part of the park. In some ways, it's just an experimental sculpture, and in fact, it was funded by a public art budget. Um, but in other ways, it's... Um, a real uh, or, or an experiment for a real um, functioning building facade in a permanent installation 
that will um, tell people not only about something like air quality, but about our collective public interest in things like the natural environment. Uh, number two, environment. Uh, speaking of environment, there's a lot of blurring lines between the projects and topics, um, but this is another project that we did at about the same time, um, and this one um, is actually ongoing, uh, but the first installation was about the same time, uh, and this one was for the city of New York. And in this case, we were exploring some of the same ideas of um, sensors and collecting information about the environment, um, but we were really interested in this project in bringing this technology, used to be called the technology of ubiquitous computing, but now it's called the Internet of Things, bringing that stuff out into a place where it's not normally uh, located, in this case, the water. You don't see a lot of this stuff out in the water, and this installation was a kind of test of that. Um, it was created by um, developing this network of floating tubes. Each tube was uh, six feet tall, half above water, half below water. There was lighting above water that was dynamic, and there were sensors below water that were sensing presence of fish, uh, water quality through dissolved oxygen, and it had a similar interface to collect text message uh, requests and therefore display something about public interest. Um, here's some of the technologies that we um, invented and also hacked together. This is um, a commercial uh, fisherman's sensor that we hacked into in order to be able to detect when fish are swimming in the East River. Uh, we created the same uh, SMS text message interface uh, or similar to the previous project. And here you get a sense of our installation out in, in the environment, in the world, in public space, in a, in a part of New York City on the East River that's a little bit industrial, and you see here a kind of industrial background, but that's also part of the kind of um, postcard skyline of, of New York City. So in the foreground, this is the Manhattan Bridge, in the background, the Brooklyn Bridge, and you see our our installation, our lights, in a kind of dialogue with the other lights of the city. So to put it slightly differently, here um, you see two different um, uh, kind of dynamic lights in the city. In the background in green, that's the Empire State Building. It's a dynamic lighting display in the city, visible you know, all around. In this case, it changes about once a night, uh, once a day. And it displays things like holidays, St. Patrick's Day, Mariah Carey concerts, things like that. Um, and our lights are changing more than once a second and displaying multiple levels of information like presence of fish, uh, environmental quality, and human interest in the environment. And so it's a little bit of a provocation to say, you know, why couldn't our dynamic facades that exist and that will exist more and more in the future um, be saying um, uh, richer information and more meaningful things. Um, here you get a sense of uh, some of our prototyping process. An interesting thing about this project is we had to do the iterative prototyping for the most part on land, even though the installation was in water because it was hard to go back and forth between land and water. Um, the conditions of the East River are actually very difficult to design for. It's a river that goes back and forth. It flows both directions and it changes direction uh, multiple times a day. And it's actually salty water, which is the worst thing for electronics and this kind of sensor technology. Um, but we were able, with a lot of collaborators, to uh, overcome some of those problems. And here you get a sense of the initial test uh, installation. Um, and this uh, kind of time lapse in more or less real time shows one of the trigger points in the data um, where the lights go from a reddish warm color to a blue cold color, and that's because of a tipping point in the data. That's giving the indication that something about the comparative water quality has changed, and therefore, for example, if you're uh, crossing the bridge and you look out and you see this floating array of lights, and you see one color one day, another color the next day, you know that something has changed. Um, these projects in some ways are inviting um, questioning and uh, further experimentation more than they are trying to make a, a point. Um, but part of the provocation is, isn't that what architecture should be doing? Um, 
The last thing I want to say about this project is that um, we did a test installation that was funded basically by a nonprofit um, uh, grant, uh, this great organization in New York called the Architectural League. Um, but in this great way that we had imagined our prototypes, um, if successful, gaining bigger traction in the world, um, this has now been commissioned by the city of New York for a much larger permanent installation. And one thing we're adding uh, in this version is biological sensors. So I already described how we have digital sensors testing for dissolved oxygen. You see the electronics and you know, the look of those. Um, but in this project, we're also going to use living muscles. And here you see a sped up version of a tank of muscles. And you see them kind of jiggling around and pulsing because muscles, when they live, they open and close their shells as part of their um, natural metabolism. Um, and it turns out that the amount uh, and the rate that muscles open and close their shells is an incredibly sensitive and sophisticated detector of water quality. In fact, better overall at detecting water pollution than our best and most expensive single purpose digital sensors. So what we're doing here is connecting a $2 Hall effect sensor to one half of a muscle shell, a cheap magnet to the other half of the muscle shell, um, and therefore harnessing the muscle's kind of natural ability to detect water pollution um, and bringing that into our ecosystem of dynamic architecture. Um, being able to change the color of the lights based on a muscle sensing, a live muscle sensing water quality in addition to digital sensors sensing water quality. And what we think is interesting here um, is the combination of artificial intelligence and natural intelligence. You know, so in other words, we're taking artificial, artificial intelligence, AI, kind of the, the holy grail um, of computation, the best a computer has to offer, and combining it with a kind of biological intelligence um, with um, you know, these uh, adaptive and um, sense, sensing systems that living organisms have evolved over millions of years um, that can be incredibly good uh, kind of computers um, because they can sense things and take action. So if that's, uh, if that's the definition of a computer, um, and have uh, different rule sets. And we think that this hybrid approach um, is incredibly rich territory for design right now. Um, this is what uh, uh, our installation is going to look like when, it's, uh, when it goes into construction next summer, which is basically a much larger version of our floating array of lights um, that is tracing a, the footprint of a historic pier and being a kind of dynamic real-time interface to um, the environment in New York City. Three, personal communication. Um, so uh, this was a project that we did um, with a very short time span and for a very small budget, but we were uh, interested in bringing some of our uh, experiments with sensors and technology and communication um, to, uh, a, in a way, a more, a more human level, uh, a more subjective territory, less subjective. Um, and this was for a commission for the Shenzhen Hong Kong uh, Biennale a couple of years ago. Um, the premise of the project was that, that the cities of Shenzhen and Hong Kong had two things that we were really fascinated with. Um, one is the uh, culture of street food and here are a few images of uh, uh, this incredible um, way that the cities transform themselves uh, right about uh, at dusk. And a lot of stores uh, will close their doors uh, in commercial districts. And immediately, there will pop out all of these temporary uh, food stalls. And a lot of people will eat uh, their meals together in public out on the street um, in these uh, temporary street food stalls. Um, we were interested in combining that street food uh, with electronics. And you know, we all know that um, Shenzhen and, and Hong Kong is a kind of center for the manufacture of both high cost electronics like cell phones, 
um, but also um, low-cost electronics like LEDs and uh, some of the technologies that we had been experimenting with. And so it was another project where we're interested in kind of combining two things that don't normally go together, uh, which is to say we wanted to combine street food and electronics. And our idea for doing that was, uh, believe it or not, to create a new kind of um, soup bowl. Um, and uh, what this meant for us was that we took this ubiquitous uh, white plastic uh, soup bowl that was everywhere in all of these street food stalls um, and we gave it a twist. In this case, we're using a simple milling machine um, not to create an interesting form uh, or connect interesting pieces, but to mill out very precisely a few layers of the bottom of this uh, soup bowl, which would allow us to uh, embed in the soup bowl um, these scrolling LED badges. And so we get a kind of a, a, a magic trick. Um, a soup bowl that looks like a normal soup bowl, but that has a message embedded in it. Um, and this basically allowed us to develop a, a project where we invited international uh, curators uh, for architecture, art, and urbanism to um, create little mini manifestos. So kind of text message length, um, provocations about uh, culture and the city. Uh, we programmed them into these kind of hacked um, scrolling LED badges. We hid the LED badges in these soup bowls. Um, and then we brought those out to our partners, which were these um, street food stalls. So here's one of the bowls as we were um, trying to put it in the hands of the um, of the, of the vendors, the street food stalls. Um, they got uh, intercepted by some local security um, who didn't want to kind of question us or arrest us or be suspicious of bombs, but they wanted to show the bulls to their friends. They thought it was interesting. Um, and here you get a sense of some of these vendors. You know, so these are our collaborators in the, in the project. Um, and this gives you a sense of the kind of live action feel. So these are the normal bulls used. Um, Often the, the food served in this is uh, a kind of brothy soup. You choose some vegetables, you choose some meats, and then you get this clearish broth. And so the materiality of the project um, here was as much the um, food as the electronics and the physical bowl. And we get this kind of before and after effect. So on the right, you see a bowl with, uh, with the food in it, with the noodle soup. And on the left, you see how it kind of uh, gets revealed uh, to have a message at the bottom. Um, to give you a sense of the messages, these are some of the things that the curators programmed into the bowls, or they're some of the messages they, um, they gave to us and we programmed that in. And this basically allowed us, here's another message, to um, kind of bring uh, uh, the discussion about architecture and urbanism in the city that normally happens at a Biennale in a civic center or in some galleries to bring it out onto the streets um, and to have a strange kind of exchange between these international art curators and the uh, local population. Um, here's one of the bowls in action. And you get this strange kind of, uh, uh, kind of system that's at once kind of personal and public. I mean, of course it's personal because it's your food and you're almost touching these messages with your, uh, your hands and your mouth. Um, but it's also public because the messages themselves are about ideas about the city. Um, and then this just gives you a sense of, of what it was like and the, the sense of um, kind of surprise and the, the kind of, um, humor also that, uh, that we were using as a design tool to um, broadcast a kind of digital message um, that would cut through the barrage of digital information we receive in the city all the time. Uh, for closed loop systems. Um, so you kind of see some of the project ideas building on each other. And this was uh, a project where we were interested in saying, 
you know, we've created uh, several different interactive systems so far. Um, let's see if we can create an interactive system that's kind of self-sustaining. In other words, if we can set up um, a kind of installation, a prototype with some dynamic um, interactions and then let it run, in this case for 30 days, without touching it. Um, so let it kind of play out uh, based on the rules. Uh, in this project, again, we started with the material in this case, or at least a material property. Here you see something that's probably familiar. It's um, honey dropping from a spoon back into a jar. And you see that it drops uh, in a kind of coil because it's a, a liquid that's viscous. Um, and it turns out that if you drop a viscous liquid like honey, or in this case, melted recycled plastic, if you drop it onto a conveyor belt um, and you you can create different patterns. Um, if the conveyor belt is moving pretty fast, you get a straight line. If it's moving slower, uh, you get a kind of wavy line based on uh, the material properties uh, of the viscous liquid. And if it's moving even slower, you get much more complex patterns, including uh, coiling and uh, even figure eight-like patterns. So our idea here was to uh, combine this uh, natural uh, material shown here, which is suspended uh, moss suspended in water, with the synthetic material, which is the plastic I just showed, in a kind of ecosystem that would play out over 30 days um, in a gallery. Um, and these uh, materials would be aggregated on top of each other, built up into a kind of wall or enclosure, and driven by data that was fluctuating. And the data in this case was real-time web searches about terms like the environment and construction. Um, so in other words, the more web searches for environment, the more the moss would be layered on. The more web searches for things like construction, the more the plastic synthetic material would be layered on. I'm going to turn down the volume here a little bit. Um, so this gives you a sense of the the kind of machine that we built for this purpose. Um, here you see it in action in uh, its first couple of days. You know, this, um, this kind of, in a way, uh, uh, large scale automated dynamic 3D printer. Um, so it's layering up this material over time, but it's driven by rules and relationships and um, changing data rather than 3D printing in a top-down way where you know exactly what you're going to get at the end. The, the way this played out was that we set the system in motion, ran it for the 30 days of the exhibition. Here you see about the first third of it. And you see at the beginning a kind of equilibrium developing this um, cylinder being extruded. But for a number of reasons, including the material and um, some changes in the data and real-time web searches, there was a kind of uh, a moment of chaos, a, a kind of tipping point. Um, but the system kept running based on its original rules. And one interesting thing that happened is that a, a new kind of equilibrium developed, um, which was a kind of uh, braided banding rather than a straight extruded cylinder. Um, so, you know, if this was the way it looked in the beginning, um, by the end, we had this kind of, um, this kind of uh, banding effect where there, you would get about four inches worth of accumulation and then it would slump over and another uh, band would, would develop. Um, and, and really, we think of that as a kind of um, a provocation for what it will be like or what it is already like to design with uncertain conditions. Um, to design without complete control and to get used to that and even to get good at designing uh, with that in mind rather than pretending um, that we are going to have complete control either during the design process uh, or after the, the building or, or city has been built. Um, five open loop systems. So this is a project um, that I'll just introduce with this video. It was a competition project 
And this was our entry into the competition. So this project uh, is called Hi-Fi, and it was um, part of the Museum of Modern Art and MoMA PS1's Young Architects Program, uh, where every summer they uh, invite uh, a young architect to create an installation in their courtyard that explores a kind of big idea for architecture. <clears throat> and really our idea here was that maybe we could create a new approach to design and materials. Um, and the idea started with uh, what I'm showing here, the carbon cycle, you know, the Earth's um, endless healthy loop of growth, decay, and regrowth. Um, and the, the idea we wanted to explore was whether our approach to building, I mean, not only for this project, but more generally, whether you know, our approach as a discipline uh, to building um, could think about temporarily borrowing materials from the carbon cycle and then returning them back to the carbon cycle um, at the end of the use uh, rather than a kind of linear process of um, extraction and waste. Um, so in other words, uh, we were hoping that we would uh, be able to show some evidence that it would be possible to um, take low value raw materials instead of high value raw materials, spend very little energy converting the raw materials to building blocks instead of spending a huge amount of energy like we do for the most part today, make a useful building uh, like we always have intended to do, um, but then return that physical stuff from the building back to the Earth's uh, healthy cycle at the end of its lifespan rather than putting it in a landfill uh, where it might last for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, a big idea, how could we possibly do this, it would seem like magic, but um, the kind of secret weapon here is mycelium. Um, so this is mycelium shown under the microscope, and it's basically the root-like structure of mushrooms um, that grows in thin white branching filaments. And it turns out that you can combine mycelium with agricultural byproduct, agricultural waste, not the high value part of our agriculture, not corn kernels, but chopped up corn stalks, the low value part of uh, agriculture. You can combine it with mycelium, put it in a mold of almost any shape, and what you see here is in about five days, uh, the mycelium grows within uh, the substrate and makes a solid object uh, that's potentially useful. Um, in this project, we work with a lot of great collaborators, including a startup company in upstate New York called Ecovative. They've been using this technique to make packaging material, 
And our idea was to use this uh, approach and, uh, uh, to create a new kind of brick. Um, and here you um, see the process of growth uh, with the brick we designed. Um, so in a way, the idea was to create a brick out of waste uh, with almost no energy to create that building block um, and therefore almost no carbon emissions. Um, here's the brick we designed. You get a sense of the shape and the, the scale. Um, and, uh, you know, an interesting thing here uh, is that we had to do a lot of physical testing again. Um, so this is taking one of our bricks and putting it in a universal testing machine at a lab at Columbia University. Uh, and here's a related test, testing an assembly of bricks. Um, and we're doing this in part because no one had made uh, architecture, at least large scale outdoor architecture, out of this material before. Um, so we had to test it. We were curious uh, what it performed like. Um, but really we did this out of necessity because as soon as we approached uh, our structural engineering partners at Arup and, and said, here's what we want to design, here's the material, can you, you know, do the calculations, um, they uh, made us quickly aware that most structural engineering software, including their proprietary version uh, that they use at Arup, shown here, most structural engineering uh, software doesn't have a drop-down menu item for mushroom brick. <laughs> so you have to do the research and the test to figure out a way to input a custom material profile into the software in order to do the calculations to see if this uh, structure uh, is sound the way you do with any structure. Um, on the first version of our uh, design of a brick, you know, each version we had to design a brick, test the brick, um, create the, not only the shape for the brick, but the shape for the overall structure. We had some problems basically indicated in red, which meant that uh, under hurricane winds, which we had to design for, uh, we were getting displacement of 30 inches or more, a little too much. Um, but after about seven pretty quick iterations, we got into a range that everyone felt comfortable with. Um, the interesting thing here is that we were iterating not just on one element alone, not just on shape of the macro structure, um, but we were iterating on material property itself and the shape of the unit, the brick, and uh, the shape of the macro structure all at the same time. And we think that's a kind of interesting ecosystem to be involved in when, when you think that you might open up the design of new materials in addition to the use of materials. Um, a <clears throat> challenging property of these bricks is that they're different on the inside than the outside. They have a kind of thin skin around the outside which holds the material together. And the inside is, it's solid, um, but it's much more porous, and that becomes a problem for moisture, and that means you can't cut these bricks on site during construction the way you could with um, some traditional bricks. And that led us out of necessity to use some computational processes. Um, so here are some iterations of the shape of a single brick. Um, and the challenge here was if we took uh, one of our existing bricks, um, we could stack it pretty reliably to create a straight wall. We could stack it pretty reliably to create a curved wall as well, but as soon as we have a doubly curved wall, then we have two issues that we need to solve that become pretty challenging when you put them together. For every course of bricks, you need to make it the right length, so uh, you need to basically space out the bricks or put the right amount of uh, material um, to create varying distances of brick course, because it's changing. Each course is a slightly different length. Um, but you also need to ensure, and this is the hard part, that every brick sits properly on two other bricks to make it into a system that will be structural in the way that was modeled in the computer. And it's actually pretty hard to solve that problem. You can easily solve the spacing problem. Um, and you can reduce the spacing by introducing a second kind of brick, a half brick, and a third kind of brick, a quarter brick, and then you can get really good at creating a brick course length of any, of any um, uh, uh, number that you have. But then if you have to ensure that every single brick is sitting properly on every brick below it, you need something like a computer to help you figure that out, especially when you have 10,000 bricks. Um, 
And although we did figure that out, that problem out before we started construction, we still had a lot to figure out in the field. Here you see the, the about three weeks of construction that we had. Um, we had a lot of rain, which was unfortunate because um, you can't uh, use mortar in the rain. Um, but the interesting thing here is that um, we had some problems to solve in the field. Uh, we had two different groups of um, really uh, smart people working on the problem. Uh, Columbia University graduate school students who know a lot about computation and geometry and form, and New York City brick masons who know a lot about stacking things and making them stand up. But neither one alone knew everything uh, necessary to solve the problem. And there was this great kind of ecosystem of labor and intelligence on site in the field um, to figure out how to make this. Um, here's an image of the completed structure, about 40 feet tall, 10,000 bricks, and shown in the context of the glass and steel uh, skyline of Manhattan in the background and the traditional brick buildings of Queens and MoMA PS1 in the foreground. Uh, so we had this structure that was at once uh, kind of familiar but also completely new. There was kind of a hybrid between digital and biological, low-tech, high-tech, um, kind of precise and computer driven, but also handcrafted and handmade. Um, but m most of all for us, we wanted to combine the test of technical performance, you know, how the bricks performed. Um, we had a lot of data in the project. So it was really about a, a technical performance of a new building material, but we also wanted it to be about aesthetic performance or creative performance. Um, what would it be like to design with this material? What would it be like to stand inside this structure? What would be um, the patterns uh, of, of stacking these bricks? What would be the layers of light and shadow, um, texture, uh, materiality, foreground to background, framing of the natural environment? Um, and we were interested in kind of designing with all of those things in mind. Um, kind of testing out the idea in, in all of its complexity. Of course, the ultimate test for any of these projects, this is the, 15 year of the 15th year of this installation in the courtyard of MoMA PS1. The ultimate test is its ability to host a party. Um, and this was the um, thrilling but terrifying moment of the first Saturday uh, party at the space where 5,000 people arrived to hear experimental electronic music. And um, they um, basically occupy the, the structure in ways that we can't control or predict. Um, but in the end, this was um, the best of all, of all places to test out the idea. In other words, we wanted to test this idea of a new material, a new approach to design, out in public, in culture, uh, within a kind of vibrant life, rather than on a lab bench, rather than uh, like some facade mock-ups are done in a kind of vacant lot um, out of reach of or, or view of anybody else. Um, and here's the, the, the structure during the parties. It also kind of took on a, a, a life of its own through some social media, which we think is an interesting potential now for architecture projects to have this kind of micro discussion of architecture through photos and very short comments. Um, we created an alternate version of the project using the same system in the lobby of the Museum of Modern Art with exploring different um, surface treatments of the material. Um, and in a way, we, we also had to explore a, a new type of drawing for this, this project, um, a new way to um, make both the representation and the construction documents. Um, but really the ultimate idea of the project was that we could take all of this um, material, we could take these bricks, and at the end of the summer, we could compost them. And that's what we did. Here you see us taking apart the structure. Um, we take the bricks, um, crumble them into smaller pieces, combine them with uh, the stuff of compost, which is bacteria, worms, and some food waste. And within 60 days, the physical stuff of the building returns to soil, which can in turn yield new plants. Um, 
And that was really the ultimate idea of the project, um, that maybe we could have this new approach to the physical stuff of our, of our buildings. And to put it slightly differently, maybe we could think about designing our buildings to disappear as much as we think about them uh, being designed to appear. Um, going from crops to construction to compost, and then back to crops again for a new, uh, uh, you know, a new use um, in a kind of healthy uh, cycle of ecosystem. Okay, I just want to describe a few more projects, but these ones will be very quick. Um, and this is a kind of uh, uh, a way that you'll see the kind of merging of a lot of um, uh, kind of techniques and approaches. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this is something that we've been doing uh, for a few years, but uh, more intensively recently. And it starts with the idea that biology of today is very different than biology of 100 years ago, than the biology inspired um, by Darcy Wentworth Thompson, um, which is to say that um, you can do things now like grow cells, um, make living organisms in isolation on a glass plate, which you just saw there through microfluidics, um, rather than growing it in an organism. You can create these incredible microscope uh, images and videos. Um, you can monitor the way that um, things like this uh, called slime mold grows in a branching adaptive way and then harness that for as a uh, kind of design engine for things at different scales like railway networks or highway networks. You can visualize um, the way that um, growth synchronizes itself as you see with tadpole embryos. Uh, this is quite remarkable. This is the way that you can visualize uh, individual neurons firing in a living tadpole through a technology called quantum dots. And my point here is that all of this is possible now and it was not possible 100 years ago. So biology of today is, is very different. And our interest is that if biology is different now, um, then maybe design with biology can be different now than it was 100 years ago. This is a collaboration we're doing with the biologist at Columbia where uh, we're taking um, colonies of bacteria which grow in these incredible three-dimensional uh, complex forms and we're using some new techniques of computation like computer vision and machine learning to try to derive um, some understanding of what's happening in the incredibly complex process of biological growth um, through techniques of computation that also weren't possible 100 years ago. Um, so this is the background for a project that I'll just show a couple things about now uh, quickly. Um, this is a collaboration with a plant biologist, and here we're taking microscope images of things like uh, xylem cells in the stems of plants. You see one here. Um, and these are microscopic cells, but we can create 3D models of them at pretty high resolution. And what we're interested in doing is seeing if we can create uh, in the computer a kind of abstracted biological algorithm of how these things work and then use that uh, as part of the design process. So we've taken some xylem cells, we're analyzing them, we're creating a centerline model of different xylem cells, analyzing things like um, angle between bars, length of bars, feeding it into a spreadsheet, using this incredible computer software invented at Cornell that you can take a, a spreadsheet and try to derive an equation to explain all the data and then that gives us an equation that loosely describes the growth of xylem cells. These exoskeletons, uh, incredibly organic, complex shapes. And here we're saying from a simple center line shown in blue, we can regenerate a, a xylem cell that looks similar to one that existed. But more importantly, we can create a xylem cell that never existed by creating a center line that never existed, an L-shaped center line. Um, and so we have this algorithm that's derived from nature, but that we can apply to situations that nature never um, proposed. Um, how could that be useful? Well, we're thinking that maybe we could start imagining the process of design slightly differently. Um, if the way we've designed for many years is, you know, this is a character, but imagine we're designing a chair, we create a kind of stick figure model of a chair, and then we determine what materials to make it out of, and we're driven by material constraints, what uh, sizes of materials there are, and, and then eventually make a chair that's shaped like this. What if we um, subdivided the problem of design into things we knew that we wanted, like the seat of a chair, things we didn't 
quite know what we wanted, like the legs of a chair, and let this process of kind of biological and computational design help us. Um, and here's some experiments we've done along those lines, which is to take this abstracted xylem cell algorithm, um, apply it in a way that we're kind of sketching out different um, kind of uh, densities within this dashed line of a bounding box, and then interconnecting um, some points within that space to create um, a huge design space of potential supports or legs for a chair. Some could be pretty typical, but some are very unusual. Some, of course, are very impractical. And here you see you know, this whole um, wild design space of possible designs for the support of a chair. But the great thing is that with the power of computation, you can generate many, many of these, potentially tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of designs, each one shown as a data point here, at very little cost, because the computer can do this automatically. And you can, in theory, derive some designs that are unexpected, that would never have occurred to you, but that are also high performing in terms of being manufacturable, in terms of being structurally sound, in terms of using material efficiently. Um, and in fact, we have 3D printed some of these um, in, in model scale and full scale. So it's a way of potentially solving practical problems like creating better designs using less material that are just as strong. But more importantly to me, it's a way of opening up the design process to create things that never would have occurred to us with our kind of human linear thinking with all of its assumptions and blind spots. To use the process of computation um, derived in some cases from biology to create entirely new ways to, to design things. Uh, seven, social robotics. Um, so this project I'll just show very briefly, but it is basically a commission for quantified self. Um, this is uh, uh, an organization you may have heard of. They do a lot with um, personal tracking. And we designed a, an event for them, a three-day event, um, with a, a variety of different components. But what I wanted to show here is that <clears throat> we also designed a robot that would respond to real-time social media about the project um, and create a drawing that was not, we weren't able to predict beforehand, but that had some rules. But more importantly to us, this represented a way that we could use um, data and computation and robotics in a way that was engaging um, socially. And this project was actually built to be a discussion starter. Um, so it was not using a kind of automated system for this kind of precise top-down control. We're going to get something that we know we want, and use computers to help us do that precisely. But we're using, in a way, the unpredictability of the system, the imperfections of the system, to engage people's uh, conversations and thoughts um, and uh, discussion among one another. Um, I'm going to, let me see. I'm going to skip this project, um, which is uh, a, a work in progress for a, a kind of architecture lab. And I just want to end with a project that we did pretty recently, which brings us back to something that we had been um, missing a little bit or wanting to add more of in our projects, which was a kind of atmosphere, a human perception, a mood um, of architecture. And in this case, we were working um, with some great ingredients to do that. This was a commission from the musician Bjork for her recent retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and this was basically um, the one new commissioned work for the museum um, in her retrospective, which was a new song and a new music video that was shot with, um, uh, to be a kind of surround immersive projection. Um, and our role was to create the architecture, the physical space um, that would support a song and a new film. So here was a kind of trailer for the music video. Here were some initial designs, but the real heart of what 
we ended up doing was taking the song called Black Lake, creating a two-dimensional map of the song um, where you see um, this uh, colorful map, which is a spectral analysis. It shows peaks in volume and um, different frequencies, the highs and lows. And we took that 2D map, projected it onto the ceiling and all the walls of the space, and used that to create a physical version of the song that would perform some practical requirements. It would dampen the sound, but it would also um, create a mood for the experience of the song. And it turned out, as a coincidence, that in our mapping of the song to the room, every second of the song corresponded to one inch of the room. So it was really a, a way to physically read um, the song. We used some parametric software and processes that are probably familiar to many of you um, to design this kind of field of cones that would respond to the 2D map. This was our way of making the 2D map of the song into something three-dimensional. Um, we used other software to kind of visualize this immersive environment um, and created this design um, for a kind of um, cave-like, barnacle-like, volcanic landscape-like um, environment to experience um, the song and the immersive video. Um, here's how we, we took a, a baseline grid of triangles and distorted it based on the 2D map of the song, created a series of panels um, and shapes. Um, here's some prototypes showing how we were going to uh, morph um, these felt cones to create this environment. Um, we set up a shop that combined kind of um, digital fabrication with uh, a level of hand um, craft um, and created an environment that in the end um, was channeling a kind of design direction from Bjork herself, which was um, to make the, 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 sh the environment feel organic. So she basically said to us, um, to me, the, 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 the previous century of design was really about geometry and math, but the, what I'm after, she was saying, and what I think is interesting, is something more organic, more biological. And that was our challenge. Use digital computation, digital fabrication, but then have it um, achieve something that in the end felt um, like something that transcended that precision. And this will be the last thing I show. It just gives you a sense of what it was like to experience the space with 50 different loudspeakers. Each one had a separate mix. It was very volumetric sound in the room. And um, the environment was about producing an architecture for a single song and an architecture for a mood that supported something uh, beyond the merely technical. Thank you. Amazing. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so um, what I want to do is just jump right into the to the uh, kind of round table. So I'd like to ask the, the students to come on up um, and we'll start the discussion and then we'll have a little time for Q&A with the audience after that. Um, so the, the, uh, the students uh, are uh, Sabri Gokman. Uh, is a PhD student uh, who is here. Uh, Sam McGinnis, uh, undergrad, right? Good, undergrad. And then uh, Sammy Shams uh, from the MS program, and then uh, Clint Castle from the graduate program. So thanks, guys. Come on up and then.
Um, David, thanks for a great presentation, first of all. It's great having you here and hear more about your uh, projects. Um, I want to ask you something around the theme of your presentation, which is adaptation. And what I found fascinating is that um, the, the array of works you showed, they actually not only show how the architecture, the design of architecture adapts to different mediums like uh, fabrication, prototyping, data mining, uh, materiality, but as well as um, you're extensively using collaboration in your work, and that's also showing a different type of adaptation of the profession. Yeah. So I want to ask you if you can also expand a bit on that and tell us kind of where you see collaboration in your work and what do you think um, it means for the future of our um, profession? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a great kind of observation. And a lot of our projects um, have involved collaboration. And that's not only, um, and I guess on multiple levels. You know, we certainly um, think of our work as um, trying to build off of work that's been done in the past, research, technical research, but also ideas and um, references from the past. So that's a kind of um, distant collaboration in my mind. But then for many of the projects, we find ourselves with um, a lot of great and really interesting collaborators who are working with us every day on the project. And these have ranged from um, artists and musicians to engineers to biologists. Um, and. Uh, often um, computer scientists as well. And, and really, this um, has been an, an essential part of our ecosystem of design. Um, and not only having others involved in the project, which I guess in many ways has roots in the way the profession works today with engineers and specialists um, working on any, any project, um, but also in feeling that we can reach out to other disciplines other interesting people um, in any domain. Like that we don't have to set up the same structure of collaboration um, that, for example, our architectural contracts always involve. You know, that we could, that we could use a wider range um, of people in a more um, fluid and creative way. Um, so having some people who are more involved in the you know, just the concept design, some people who are technical specialists and, and you know, ranging in, in duration and in involvement and in role and in expertise. Um, and that's been a, a, a great kind of creative freedom for us to just feel the kind of audacity and, and naivete, allow ourselves the naivete to think that we could do that and that something interesting might, might happen. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that, though, is that one thing I've been thinking about recently is that um, that idea, like that's that's a kind of a concept in a way, that a concept that our our design teams could change, right? And so that's that seems pretty pretty true. And you know, we could talk about the details of that. But what I've been realizing recently is that it depends so much on the exact people. So that kind of transcends the concept because it's not just that like an architect could collaborate with a biologist, but it really takes the right people in all of the weird intangible things that are true in any conversation or relationship or discussion or you know, and and that involves you know people's thoughts but and their expertise, but also their motivations and their temperaments and all of this stuff and. So that adds this whole other level, which just makes things more interesting and rich and, and less formulaic. So oftentimes, do you uh, seek out a client for a project, or do you kind of have the idea in your head and you go out and um, try to find somebody to uh, make this project work for? Like when the brick projects here, the mycelium and the corn stock, it's very interesting. And you have a lot of applications around a building, but did someone Give you that idea, or did you kind of make it and find it out for yourself? Um, I guess the short answer is that it, we we could 
we have put it together in a lot of ways, and we, we continue to look for opportunities to do it in a lot of ways. So there's some things that you know we've been interested in for a while, and we try to see if it you know might be a match for a, a, a project, a commission, or you know whatever. Um, but I think there's there's some things like ideas or um, directions for a project that that bubble up because of the project, um, and so. You know, we have some kind of more self-initiated things, and I guess the the project with bricks and for PS One that that was a commission, but it's an incredibly unique commission to be asked to um, to propose an idea and to test it like on this very um, kind of public stage um, with almost no strings attached. I mean, the strings are basically the budget and the time frame, which are actually really confining strings, but um, but really, you know, this kind of the sky is the limit, and it's this incredibly unique and optimistic program for young architects. So I feel very lucky to have been through that. Um, but some other projects, you know, we, we will work very much with the client and, and some of their ideas and needs and um, inspirations become part of the mix as well. So I think we could kind of go go either way. but. There's something in a way that, you know, I'd, I'd like to say supports my idea about the ecosystem of design that's somehow relevant. Like, you know, a certain type of project in some ways kind of breeds more of that or further versions of that. Um, and, and that is just through, again, a kind of intangible network of ideas and connections and opportunities that comes up. So, you know, because we had been interested in some sensor stuff, we got some other opportunities to do sensor stuff. And because now we've been interested in materials like the bricks with low embodied energy, we're getting contacted by some people who are very interested in that too. So it kind of can build on itself. Uh, thank you for coming again. Um, I know Jared Scott, um, really wants to focus on, especially in this upcoming year and the next coming few years, how we can facilitate cross-functional uh, kind of integration, how we can get other people from different schools, engineering schools, business schools, inter interacting with the architecture department. Um, is there any kind of framework at Columbia that facilitates that kind of collaboration between different, different fields? Um, I mean, the short answer is no, not, not really, <laughs> I mean, as, as, as you know. But I think um, the thing that's been interesting to me is that there's no real framework to support that. Um, but also, I've found that at Columbia, and in a lot of cases more broadly, there's also probably no one that's going to say no. So it's, in some ways, a, a decent time to be doing that at Columbia, but I think probably in other places as well. Um, and, and it's almost like instead of having to go out and actively do it, I think if we just like remove the idea that we can't do it, then I think it will happen more naturally. And you know, one thing we were, we were talking about a little bit um, before the lecture was um, this blurring of the lines, not only between departments at schools, but between schools and companies, um, and not only that, but schools and kind of big companies that might fund research or have R&D, but then startup companies that might have ideas and might even be growing out of schools. And for that, I actually see a lot of interest in the framework to make it happen, you know, as we were talking about a little bit earlier. These you know incubators. Everyone is making an incubator right now, and I think that's that's not by accident. It's something that's a, a really appealing response to this interest in blurring the lines between disciplines, in doing things new and testing things out quickly, in allowing schools to kind of be an engine for innovation and. In, bigger companies, but also allowing schools to work with startup companies or schools to start startup companies. And the incubator is the framework because it's like the physical space that has some desks and some rules and sometimes some equipment um, that, that's trying to think about this environment. How can we get 
newer things happening? How can we, in a way, in the, in the best possible way, they're trying to, incubators are trying to create the space for an idea that hasn't happened yet that they can't even tell like who's gonna have it or who should be there or what disciplines it will involve. So it's this kind of beautiful and difficult question of like how do you, how do you anticipate that? How do you create the right conditions for the thing that you can't even describe yet? And so, um, and in that respect, actually, Columbia, like probably a lot of schools, is doing a version that I'm involved with. Um, and it's launching, actually, just right now, which is, a, we're calling it the GSAP Incubator, Columbia School of Architecture, is called GSAP. Um, and it's going to be a, a small incubator with probably about 20 recent graduates who are um, working for a project, working on a project for about a year um, in a physical space together, which itself will be connected to an incubator that the new museum in New York City has started. So the new museum has this incubator, and they're trying to bring the art world next to this world of startups and innovation. And we're experimenting with being close to them and the art world and this cultural organization, plus the kind of tech scene of New York City. And, um, and as, as, I, as I heard, there's a version, of the, you know, a version of that here that you guys are doing as well, that, that Georgia Tech as a whole is doing, right? Um, so you've talked a lot about collaboration and your interaction with other people who have expertise that you've used. Um, but a lot of your projects end up being very public facing and um, have an interaction kind of component with the public. Um, is that something that you take into consideration throughout the project or is it sort of just a goal? Um, like or when you produce something or is there a, like kind of a give and take to that? Um, What's that process like? Yeah, that's right? interesting. Um, I mean, I'd like to say that it's it's as um, essential and as part of the iterative process as the more technical things. Um, and you know, I think something that's been important to to me and to our work has been to explore s some new technologies um, uh, and some kind of new approaches but not be um, single dimensional about it. So in other words, the, the project with the bricks, for example, um, you know, there's a huge amount of technical work still to be done on that project. And we could have decided to spend all of our energy just on innovating that single best brick. And in some ways, you could argue that that, that is work that really needs to be done. And if we had to prioritize, we should have spent more energy on that. Um, because that, you know, potentially has really big uh, applicate, wide applications. But what we kept reminding ourselves, because we believe it very strongly, is that the most interesting thing is, and probably what we're arguing implicitly, the, the, the role of the architect, we believe, should be to factor in many things. The technical performance of the brick, like how strong, how weather resistant, um, but also, um, you know, will, will people like it? Will they either be curious? Will they um, have a double take because it looks familiar, but then it's something's off about it? And that part is, is equally interesting. And, and the combination of the two, the technical plus that kind of public interaction part, is, is what we think is both most interesting, but also we're, we're kind of arguing implicitly is, is most important for, for architecture, to not only do the technical, but also not only do the kind of spectacle or the, you know, just the, the crowd-pleasing. <laughs> not that our project was crowd-pleasing, but you know. And so it's a good question. Um, I think like most of us, I was pretty surprised when you mentioned that your company was acquired by Autodesk, um, because we, we do have, um, a distinguished PhD program here, and um, our uh, PhD students do a great work on BIM software and developing the technical um, technological tools that are necessary for the program to run. And you, you also mentioned a little bit about uh, the companies, the startups, the dynamic relationships or bonds between other collaborations 
And I was just interested to hear more of your thoughts about being acquired by a company that is more run holistically compared to being in the dynamic field or dynamic rubric of production. So I, went, I was wondering if you could reflect a bit on that experience. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, as, as Scott mentioned, it's still very much a work in progress, um, the, the kind of uh, role of the living within Autodesk. Um, but uh, <laughs> I know. Sounds funny. <laughs> um, uh, but I think, t you know, to me, it's been very interesting for, in a couple of ways. I mean, I I've always been interested in kind of looking at things in a slightly different perspective and exploring new ways of looking at, you know, a material or a, a kind of computational design ecosystem or a way that we interact with our phones or food or whatever, um, public space, definitely. Um, so when the, the idea of the acquisition was proposed to me, it's not something I went out seeking, um, but it was like one of these things that comes up and, you know, in practice, I really started thinking it would be a great opportunity to experiment with um, what a practice is itself, you know, and I think Scott has, I've had a long running discussion with Scott about what practice is and what it could be since way before I knew people at Autodesk. But I had already been working with some people at Autodesk and, and so I'm interested in thinking that, well, you know, could we redefine what it means to be not only, um, you know, a, a small architecture practice but an experimental architecture practice and an independent architecture practice and you might think that some of those things are exclusive to be to being acquired by Autodesk, right? Like maybe you can't be experimental anymore, you can't be small anymore, you can't be um, uh, you know agile anymore. But I think that would be too too simple and easy. Um, and so I think for me, it's interesting to experiment with the model of a small architecture practice, which I still consider myself to be running a small architecture practice, even though it's owned by a big company. Um, and I think it's also interesting just more generally and reflects some more general trends that big companies, I think, are interested in that too. They're interested in the way that they can act maybe more like small companies sometimes, or they can own small companies that are independent and don't get full direction from the top. Um, and anyway, it was a mistake to, for me to ever think, which I once did, that uh, Autodesk had some master plan that was entirely run from the top down because it's people who work there and they're on teams and those teams, even if they're trying to do the corporate thing of you know make money and advance the products, have a lot of complexity and different independence. And there's this great research unit of Autodesk, which um, is a lot of people doing stuff very familiar to me as running you know, similar to the stuff I'm doing running a small experimental practice and similar to a lot of stuff at schools. So th what I'm trying to say is the lines are, are blurrier than they might at first seem. And I think that's, that's really interesting and exciting right now. A and I would even argue without knowing much about corporate history that it's probably a unique time for that. You know, that there were days where you know, Xerox, even if it had a research arm, was run very much from the top and companies were hierarchical and they protected their IP. Um, and I think now there's much, there's much more fluidity. And it's in a way kind of scary for everybody because there, there are no set models anymore. Like, but I think everyone's willing to take a lot of risks, which makes it an interesting time. Um. I was wondering if any of you had any additional questions, or maybe we can also take some questions from the audience, if anybody wants to add. Um, is there any dying question? Yeah. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Super the, um, I, my question has to do with durability. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on durability in relationship to the things that you're doing in your practice. Interesting. I thought you were going to say in relation to the bricks, but you're saying in relation to everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I want to I want to share one thought about the bricks, and then I'll say something about everything. But um, so, I mean, one short version of of the bricks is um, 
that we did some accelerated aging testing on the bricks because we wanted to make sure they would be safe for the summer. It was, in a way, an easy first step to make these bricks last just for one summer in New York City. Um, and the accelerated aging tests were, were really um, positive. We did three years of simulated New York City summer, um, and the bricks still had the same mechanical properties. Um, so they were just as strong after that. So you know, we basically exposed them to wet and dry to simulate rain and UV exposure to simulate sun and things like that. Um, but I think you know, a lot more testing would have to be done if we wanted to make permanent structures out of these bricks. But one thing that's been really interesting to me is that um, when working with a biological ingredient, we have a, a kind of range of possibilities that might not be possible with more typical ingredients, like concrete probably has some more limitations, but if you have some living element of concrete, then maybe you can expand the possible palette of what kinds of concrete you can make. And because of some of the collaborations in biology I've done recently, I, I truly do believe what one of my friends and collaborators said, which is we can dial in any properties you want you know, if you give us a couple years to research on it. So the big picture of that is that I think we could start thinking about architectural materials and we could say, you know, we normally specify architectural materials and we say we want a certain color, a certain finish, a certain maybe strength. You know, we specify those things. But what if we could also specify durability or in other words, lifespan? And we could um, specify a two month brick or a two year brick or a 20 year brick or a 40 year brick. And I think that's really interesting and helps me make my kind of point about life cycles because I would argue that a lot of our materials are way over specified by accident because you take that concrete out of a building after you wreck the building and you put it in a landfill and then it's lasting way too long because it's sitting there for a hundred or a thousand years and same with the steel. Um, bigger picture though, um, I guess I, I have some s similar feelings about um, my kind of practice and my projects as I do about the, about the material I just described that um, I think there's some projects and ideas that have a kind of short lifespan and maybe we don't know it in advance but it turns out they do and that could be good or bad, sometimes disappointing. It's like wasn't as um, revealing or relevant as we had hoped or something. Um, but maybe they touch other ideas and projects that can give them some you know, different form of life in the future. But we do think that some of the things we're onto now will be pretty durable. Like in other words, the idea of like, this hybrid approach and artificial intelligence and natural intelligence, we think that potentially could be a pretty durable framework. You know, whether it means a, a project we do or just a framework that's kind of in the air that we're working with and other people are working on too. I mean, that, that's the, I wanted to draw you out a little bit on that issue because at face value, if you're sort of seeing the projects for the first time, there's a there's a deep ephemerality associated with yeah. it. But the, the durability question at second or third look is, is really there, related to life cycle of the material, longer durability, uh, greater durability related to uh, ecological structures, environmental systems, et cetera. It's a yeah. really great tension between something that's performative and here for just a short period that has much more profound um, impact on larger systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. About. Thank you. Maybe we could have one more question. Um, I'll pass the mic. <laughs> I'm curious about the design intent behind the form of the PS1 exhibition. And it reminded me a lot of concrete grain silos or of like truly uh, buildings in Italy. So I'm wondering how you're combining this experiment of these bricks and advancement in technology and material and how you expect that to kind of influence the design of buildings that might use these in the future. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I think, in a way, that there are a couple things you're saying, and they, they are part of my thinking about it and my answer, which is to say, like, so why was the form the way it was? Um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to describe, and there's no single kind of reference that we had in mind. But I think we did channel probably several influences, um, you know, including both ancient structures that have similarities of form and materiality, and then much more modern ones, and some that are kind of hopeful, um, and some that are a little sinister, like including maybe, you know, nuclear power plants or things like that. Um, in the end, um, we we explored a lot of you know macro forms for the project, a lot of a lot of shapes for the project, as we were exploring a lot of ideas and a lot of versions of the material, and um, and so what we were looking for more than a kind of design aesthetic with the form was the right match. And again, and so now I'm kind of circling back to the ecosystem idea, like we were looking for the right set of parts that would that would be viable, that might be interesting, that would um, resonate in a couple of different ways. And so more specifically, we, we set early upon having a kind of open um, view to the sky, which it turns out, if you think about it, um, which I didn't at the beginning, is a, a, a really hard problem to solve structurally because our structural engineers kept saying, if we just could put a roof on this thing, then we could solve a lot of your structure problems. And we kept saying, I know, I know, but you know, we, we don't want to do that. That's part of the experience. So you know, part of it was actually driven by some of the reasons that we probably share similarity in form to some ancient structures, which is we wanted to draw air in the bottom and bring it out the top. And it was a summer, um, you know, for a summer uh, installation. And it was supposed to be used for shade and kind of cooling on hot days. Um, so that probably was a, a kind of a, a relevant similarity. Um, but really, you know, if we think toward the future, we also wanted to um, give the material some, put the material to some tests. You know, so if we had made a version, which we did in the beginning, that was only this tall, that's not that big a test. If we had made a wall that stacked straight, that's not that big a test. If we had made a single closed cylinder, especially with the roof, but even without a roof, that's not that big a test. So we were kind of playing with the limits. How far could we go? But we didn't want to go too far. For example, this doesn't deal with the form, but we originally thought, hey, this material, it, like, it decays over time and new things grow. That should be part of the project. It should be always decaying and growing for the three months of the project. And then we had to say, wait, wait a minute. Like, one, we're never going to win the competition if we go in saying that. And two, that's just, that's too many things. That's too many tests. It's greater chance of failure. So we're trying to hit that sweet spot. And I guess that, that's my kind of general answer to the form, but also the, the rest of bringing the ingredients together. And I guess that you know, brings me back to wanting to make that point about the ecosystem. You know, so really, when we design, we, we think very deliberately about the factors together and what, what will combine, whether it's collaborators or technologies or experiences and try to put together a kind of hypothesis each time that could be interesting. I think we have one more question. Uh, During our uh, brief discussion earlier, you mentioned uh, that every studio and every firm should ask the question, what is architecture? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to ask you that question. I feel like it's too vague. But. <laughs> Uh, within your firm, what's what do you feel like your firm, the living, what what is the living's role in the modern landscape of architecture development? Mm. And maybe you can also expand it on the cycle that kept occurring in the presentation because you're not only thinking about transformation of materiality but also design cycle, yeah. also cyclic behavior in the systems you're creating. So maybe you can also mention that. Um. Yeah, I mean, those are good and hard questions. But I guess I should say that, um, you know, we, we do a, a lot of the things that, I'm, that I've talked about in a lot of our projects, um, you know, in some ways they're, they're pretty weird and, you know, some are radical and some are probably good ideas, some bad ideas. Um, 
but they're not they're not solitary. And you know, even as weird as our weirdest experiments have gotten, there's an, we found other communities of people working on similar questions and similar issues. So if I'm trying to think about what is our role, I mean, sometimes we just we try to um, you know push an idea or or yeah, re ask the question what what is architecture? What could architecture be um, in a new way? But then we do want to um, respond and be part of a bigger dialogue that involves the history of architecture. And you know, clearly some of our experiments have been influenced by a lot of experimentation before us. You know, not only things like Buckminster Fuller, but you know, things way before that, experiments with you know, concrete as a new material and things like that. Um, and then currently, there are a lot of people working at some of these same intersections of biology and computation. Um, and so I think we, when we're developing projects, we kind of want to want to be part of that and kind of part of that bigger discussion. In some ways, like prodding it forward, but in other ways, like filling in gaps that you know might not have been filled in by another project. Um, you know, occasionally trying something that seems um, far out and maybe doesn't have an equivalent, but, but always, you know, kind of in dialogue. And that's the way, I guess, that we do hope our project has maybe not to, not to claim durability as a name, but um, kind of a, a relevance as a name, to be relevant and to be relevant on multiple registers, not only to some, you know, new high performance material or algorithm, but to some cultural trend that's harder to name, um, to something, to some anxiety that we have. Um, and you know, if nothing else, something I've returned to a lot recently is to try to continually challenge our, our defaults, our cliches, uh, our blind spots, as I was mentioning before. Um, so if we can identify a cliche um, or a kind of a, a default reaction of ourselves or in others, that's a good you know, area to look closer to us. And that's what we found a lot of our approaches um, and our projects aiming to do is like say, hey, can we jump out of what the default solution to this would be? And the latest one I'm thinking about, which is a real riddle for me, is um, if our responses to climate change are becoming a little bit default, then do those need to be jarred a little bit? But at the same time, could there be some, not necessarily cliches, but some um, beliefs, some, some challenges, some common understandings, like climate change is a huge problem and we better address it, that are kind of beyond challenging or like, you know, I, I wouldn't want to create projects that are just being contrary to the idea that climate change is our most urgent problem because I believe that so deeply. <laughs> so, but it was a good question. Uh, thanks for an engaging conversation and uh, presentation. Um, Sabri, Sam, Clint, and Sammy for doing this. It's great. Great questions, and um, thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.